Hey, it's Flo, with a super weird word, nightgown. If you ask me, it sounds less like clothes you wear to bed and more like things you say to your clothes. Good night, capri pants, sleep tight sweaters, nightgown. We've got a big day tomorrow. Now a weird word I just made up, flotection. It sounds like great protection for your new home through me and Progressive, and that's because it is. I said good night, capri pants, go to sleep. Save an average of 17% on car insurance when you bundle home and auto through Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and other insurers. Discount not available in all states or situations. This is Peter on his motorcycle. Oh, the open road! And this is Peter off his motorcycle. Um, please move your paper off my desk. Thank you. On his motorcycle. I feel so alive! Off his motorcycle. I feel like we covered that already, so... On. Wow! Look at the ocean! Off. Look at this article I found about urban planning. You're better on your bike. Progressive helps keep you on it. Get a quote in as little as three minutes at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Hi, I'm Max. And before handing you over to Sam, I just wanted to take a minute to tell you about my show, the Latin American History Podcast. If, like me, you're enjoying hearing about Britain's first forays into the Americas, you might be curious about what was going on to the South, in Spanish and Portuguese America. The Latin American History Podcast is a chronological account, starting from the very first human presence on the continent, and eventually going right up to the present day. So far, we've looked at the pre-Hispanic cultures and civilizations, the voyages of Columbus, how the Caribbean and Panama were colonized, and we've just finished a 13-part series on Cortez's conquest of Mexico and Central America. So if that sounds interesting to you, search for the Latin American History Podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. Now that's enough from me. Over to Sam for the next episode of Pax Britannica. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 43, Mystic Massacre. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week, we covered the event which immediately preceded the Pequot War, the murder of John Oldham. Oldham was an English trader who had fallen victim to indigenous politics, envy for his success, and a misunderstanding. Vassals of the Narragansett attacked his ship and butchered Oldham. We saw how his murder was conflated with the death of John Stone, and became part of a package of grievances laying at the feet of the Pequot. We also covered how the Massachusetts Bay Colony reacted to Oldham's death, a raid to exterminate the natives which had killed him, and then an attempt to humble the Pequot. Both failed. The natives of Block Island fled and hid, leaving the English nothing to kill but some dogs, and they burnt their villages. The residents of Pequot Harbour likewise fled, leaving the English to burn their fields and homes, but were otherwise unscathed and very, very angry. I should say that we'll be covering some especially brutal violence in this episode. I don't go into excessive detail, but just to make you aware that the episode title is relevant. Last week, we left off with the first days of the siege of Fort Saybrook the settlement at the mouth of the Connecticut River. The commander, Lieutenant Lyon Gardner, had repeatedly come under attack by Pequot warriors as he and his men attempted to gather supplies. This siege lasted throughout the winter. On the occasions that Gardner sent out a foraging party, it almost always came under attack from Indians. This was a war between two cultures of warfare, and the English rapidly discovered their style was outmatched in the situation. The English militia was accustomed to forming up into formation and bringing mass musket fire to bear on their opponents. This wasn't a bad idea on a European battlefield. Far from it, 
The military revolution was refining this system to lethal efficiency, and a properly drilled and disciplined formation was the objective of any European sergeant. Most of the militia commanders in the Pequot War, including Lion Gardner, John Mason, John Underhill, Miles Standish, and probably John Endicott, had been trained or seen service in the Netherlands, either during the Thirty Years' War or in the earlier Dutch Revolt. This was the heart of the military revolution, and so it's no surprise that the English officers' approach to warfare wouldn't have looked out of place in a field in Flanders. But this wasn't Flanders, and they weren't facing a conventional force. The Pequot ran rings around them. Even had the colonial militias been professional and disciplined, which they weren't, this style of warfare would have struggled against the Pequot tactics. The point of a formation was to bring the maximum amount of firepower to bear on a single target, and ensure maximum effectiveness. But the Pequots weren't cooperating. They did not create their own formations on open ground. Though it was centuries away from being called such, they used guerrilla tactics. Individuals or small groups using mobility and cover to ambush and whittle down the English numbers. Like we saw last week, if the English stood on open ground in their neat formations, the Pequot would simply pepper their ranks with missiles from the safety of the tree line. If the Pequot could not ambush the English, or the English began to rally after being so ambushed, the Pequot would quickly withdraw before the firepower of the English guns could be brought to bear. All of this was helped by their superior knowledge of the landscape. Pequot warriors could flank English columns along paths the colonists didn't even know existed, faster than they could react, and then disappear just as swiftly. After days of this constant harassment, a Pequot delegation arrived at Fort Saybrook. Gardiner's account details how he sent out men to ensure this wasn't yet another ambush, and had two Saker guns, a form of artillery, loaded and aimed at where the Pequot had gathered. If he gave the signal, waving his hat above his head, then the cannons were to open fire. Then Gardiner went out to parley, the Pequots moving to meet him. I'll quote from Gardiner's account now. They said, have you fought enough? We said, we knew not yet. Then they asked if we did use to kill women and children. We said they should see that hereafter. So they were silent a space, and then they said, We are Pequots, and have killed Englishmen, and can kill them as mosquitoes, and we will go to Connecticut, and kill men, women, and children, and we will take away the horses, cows, and hogs. This exchange is interesting for a few reasons. Ronald Dale Carr, in his article, Why Should You Be So Furious? The Violence of the Pequot War, suggests that the Pequots were trying to establish how this conflict would be fought. Conventional warfare between European states, warfare which Gardiner was experienced in, had established rules of conduct, though they weren't always or even mostly followed. Military ethics, not to mention Christian principles, dictated that non-combatants should be spared. When a fortress surrendered in a siege, an outright massacre of the defenders was no longer the most likely outcome. Honourable withdrawal, along with a bit of feasting between officers, was increasingly likely. Summary executions, massacres, and collective punishments were meant to be reserved for rebels, heretics, and heathens. Although the Pequots were not Christian, and didn't have Gardiner's experience of European war, they too usually avoided killing women and children. Up to this point, they had kept to this rule in their conflict with the English. Here at this parley, the Pequots asked if the English were willing to kill non-combatants, and Gardiner was non-committal. Perhaps he would have treated the Pequots as honourable enemies, and both sides could have agreed to leave non-combatants out of it. But this was not Gardiner's war, and he could not answer for his superiors. Endicott, he knew, was perfectly willing to kill Indian civilians. His commission the previous year had been to do just that and he had only been prevented because they ran away. His only answer was, they should see about that hereafter. In other words, they would have to find out. 
Matters weren't helped by the fact that the speaker and his entourage came to the parlay wearing English clothes, taken from the men they had killed over the previous days. Gardiner denied his subordinates' demands that they open fire on the Pequots at this insult, as this was a parlay. Though, like all things, we have to take Gardiner's account with a hefty pinch of salt. In response to this, Gardiner claims to have said, I bid him tell them that they should not go to Connecticut, for if they did kill all the men and take all the rest as they said, it would do them no good but hurt. For English women are lazy and can't do their work, horses and cows will spoil your cornfields, and the hogs their clam banks, and so undo them. Instead, if I'm reading it right, Gardner boasted about all the loot held in Saybrook, and told them that they should stay here, fight them, and leave the towns of Connecticut alone. They could always raid the towns after they killed everyone in Fort Saybrook. Again, this paints Gardner in a certain light, brave and selfless, inviting an attack to give the settlers time to prepare, and again, pinches of salt may be needed. When the Pequots heard this, they became, quote, mad as dogs, and ran back to where they had first appeared. Then, Gardner gave the signal, taking off his hat and waving it above his head, and the two Sakers shot a hail of musket rounds at the retreating Pequot. Instead of taking Gardner's friendly invitation to try and kill him, a few days after the Pequot left, they carried out their threat. Weathersfield, a town along the Connecticut River which we talked about in episode 41, had been settled on land purchased from the Wangunk. But relations with the Wangunk had soured, apparently after the colonists failed to pay for some land, as well as the usual tensions between settler and native. Still, relations remained fairly cordial. And so when a man ran into Weathersfield on the 27th of April, 1637, to warn the town, that he had seen hundreds of Indian warriors on the march, he was ignored. The combined Pequot and Wangunk force killed six men and three women in the town of Weathersfield, as well as slaughtering a number of cattle and horses before carrying off two young girls. This wasn't the only attack on the towns of Connecticut, and there were several other raids and ambushes. In total, about 30 colonists were killed. This might not seem a huge number, but this was around 5% of Connecticut's total population. A significant loss, and even though the Connecticut colonies had disapproved of Endicott's expedition, they were not prepared to simply weather the assault. Connecticut had not yet established its fundamental orders, but a provisional general court had come into being once the MBC's supervision expired in 1636. This general court met on the 1st of May, in the aftermath of these raids, and voted to go to war with the Pequots. The General Court dispatched Captain John Mason of Windsor, at the head of 90 men, with instructions to travel to the heart of Pequot territory, and destroy them. Begun, the Pequot War had. Wait, I said that last week, didn't I? Well, I may have been too hasty, as it turns out that the Connecticut Declaration of War has been dated by some historians as the start of the conflict. Not all, though, and I'd imagine that the defenders of Fort Saybrook would disagree that hostilities had only just begun. But what about the Pequot's indigenous neighbours? There was bad blood, of course, particularly between them and the Narragansett, but the English had, from the Pequot perspective, attacked unprovoked. Sassacus, the Pequot great sachem, did his best to make hay of this, and sought to convince the Narragansett and his disloyal vassals that the English were a danger to all of them, and would not stop if they defeated the Pequot. Only by joining together now could the invaders be thrown back into the sea. These calls, as prescient as they may have been, fell on deaf ears. The Pequots had thoroughly alienated many of their neighbours over the last few years, and their peace with the Narragansett had never been stable. It would have been unlikely for the two rivals to ally against the English, even without the efforts of one Roger Williams. Yes, our old exile friend's diplomatic skills came to the fore in this war. 
He argued the English case to his friend, Miantonomo, the sachem of the Narragansett, and was instrumental in bringing about their alliance with the English against the Pequot. Similarly, the close bonds between the English and Uncas, the sachem of the Mohegan, meant that they too joined the colonists against their former overlords, the Pequot. This wasn't so much of a surprise, after all, Uncas had done his best to start this war. In fact, the only native allies that answered the Pequot's call were some Niantic vassals, and not even all of them. Some remained neutral, others sided with the English. Hey everyone, I'm Corey. I'm Natalie, and we are the Art History Babes. We have a podcast on this network where we talk about art and drink wine sometimes and talk about culture and sometimes we take a break and play phone games. What you been playing lately, Nat? Oh, you know I've been playing Best Fiends and I'm up to like level 252. It's called Blocked Blast. I've been working with Whisper. Whisper's great. We work together. So what keeps you invested in this game? I know you've been playing it for a while. It's just a good way to relax while still feeling like my brain is somewhat working to figure out these puzzles and the levels keep changing and evolving, making it more challenging and yeah, keeping me invested. Would you say this is more of like a casual relaxing type game or do you get like super competitive with it i play with my significant other so we get a little competitive sometimes but you know it's all for the fun of the game best fiends has thousands of levels already with new levels events and characters added every month it's hours of fun right at your fingertips and guess what you can even play offline i love that with over 100 million downloads and tons of five star reviews best fiends is a must play download best fiends free on the apple app store or google play that's friends without the r best fiends on the 18th of april 1637 a few weeks before the weathersfield raid the massachusetts general court had voted to fully prosecute war with the pequots authorizing the raising of 160 militiamen in may captain john mason at the head of 90 connecticut militia rendezvoused with allies at Fort Saybrook. Twenty Massachusetts militiamen, under the command of John Underhill, had been present at the fort for two months, at the request of Saybrook. The Pequots were an obvious and tangible threat, but there were also concerns about the neighbouring Dutch. It wasn't beyond the realms of possibility that a force could sail out from New Amsterdam and seize a weakened Saybrook. Yet another reminder that this is an interconnected world, and the English are not the only European players in the scene. The English colonists from Connecticut and Massachusetts were joined by a Mohegan force led by Sachem Uncas, as well as elements of Narragansett and Eastern Niantic. The presence of native allies is particularly important to note. Aside from the benefit of providing extra fighting men, they matched the Pequot's knowledge of the land, They could guide the English columns through the wilderness, and lent their tracking capabilities to the colonists. Keely, they were also better navigators of the riverways of the region. It's also yet another reminder, if one is needed, that in many ways the Pequot War was the culmination of indigenous politics with English interlopers. Yet, the colonists were now the prime movers of the conflict, and they would make their presence count. Though their precise written orders have not survived, what can be pieced together from accounts and the events to come indicate that the expedition had a similar mission to Endicott's, to avenge English honour for the deaths of Stone and Oldham, and to bring the Pequots to submission. While we don't know the exact wording of their commission, we do know that it involved a blunt assault into enemy territory, and the boots on the ground didn't like it. Mason was in overall command. As I've mentioned, Mason was a veteran of the Thirty Years' War. He knew one end of a pike from the other, and the weakness of his force would have been obvious. Just over a hundred colonial militia, and around eighty native allies, was a tiny force. Worse, most of the militia were inexperienced in combat and the terrain. After reading Mason's commission, Gardiner and Underhill told him outright 
that the force was not fitted for such a design. The orders called for a pitched battle, but they would be outnumbered and in unfamiliar territory. Instead, it was agreed that it was better to obey the spirit of the orders than the letter, though for the legalistic Puritans this required an intervention from a chaplain to ensure that it was God's will that they disregard the orders. Rather than face the Pequots in open battle, a better use of their smaller numbers was a raid. The ships of the Allied force set sail from Saybrook and headed east towards the Thames River, the heart of Pequot territory. And then, in full view of the coast, they kept sailing. Once the fleet reached Narragansett Bay, safely out of sight of any Pequot scouts, the soldiers disembarked and began to march back west. Mason describes it as an uncomfortable journey, a march of several miles through uneven terrain, on a hot day, with few supplies. Some of the militia fainted. After about 12 miles, the force stopped at Portucket River, where Mason describes his Narragansett allies as manifesting great fear, with many of them deserting. The Mohegans and Sachem Uncas receive no end of praise from Mason in his account, as they swear to stand with the English. The now diminished force marched on for a few more miles, before they again halted at a Pequot cornfield. Here, the officers gathered and discussed their plan. Their indigenous allies explained that there were two Pequot settlements nearby. Mason describes how he was eager to attack both at the same time, despite being warned that these forts were impregnable, and only chose not to do so because they couldn't reach the second one soon enough. Again, pinches salt. After learning that Sassacus was in the second fort, Mason recalls being much grieved. Nevertheless, the officers settled on merely attacking one impregnable fortress rather than two. The march continued, as silent as possible, until an hour after sunset. Stopping near two hills, the force camped down without a fire and with rocks for pillows, so Mason says, and they rested after a day marching. Militia scouts reported back that they heard singing coming from the fort. As Mason had hoped, the Pequots had watched the English ships sail out of Saybrook along the coast and right past the Thames River. They assumed that they were sailing east to head home to Massachusetts, afraid of facing the Pequot in battle. Singing and celebration echoed out from the fort until midnight. In the morning, the militia assembled and prayed for God's providence, before following their native allies along a path straight to the fort. After a two-mile march, again in silence, they came to the foot of the hill, and another field of corn. I'll quote from Mason here. At length, Uncas and one Weequash appeared. We demanded of them, where was the fort? They answered, on the top of that hill. Then we demanded, where were the rest of the Indians? They answered, behind, exceedingly afraid. We wished them to tell the rest of their fellows that they should by no means fly, but stand at what distance they pleased, and see whether Englishmen would now fight or not. As the fort had two entrances, the English divided into two groups. Mason commanded one, Underhill the other. After another prayer for God's providence, the militia climbed the hill. They kept the element of surprise almost to the gates of the fort itself, before a dog caught their scent and barked, alerting the Pequots. Far from being impregnable, the fort at Mystic River was a far cry from the fortresses known to the veteran Underhill and Mason. There were no defensive outworks, just a wooden palisade with plenty of gaps to shoot through. The Pequots, likely due to the fleet's misdirection, hadn't posted sentries either. Why would they? Their enemies had fled back home. And while I mentioned the gates of the fort, the entrances were blocked by nothing sturdier than some stacked brushes and branches, easily removed by the attackers. 
The English were only helped by the existence of that other fort. The fighting men were split between the two, leaving Fort Mystic populated mostly by women and children. The officers had previously agreed to kill all the Pequots with bullet and blade in order to save the plunder, and initially things went to plan. Mason recounts several Pequots being shot or cut down as the English entered the fort, but the scene was chaotic. Dozens of tents and wooden buildings filled the fort, and after Mason entered one, he was jumped by several Pequots before he managed to escape. Other militiamen found Pequots hiding under beds, or waiting to attack those that entered. Mason's force was still outnumbered, the Pequots were stiffly resisting, and the noise would soon summon reinforcements from the neighbouring fort. Searching each tent, killing the occupants, moving on to the next, would take too long and risk English lives. It's also likely that not all of the militia, many of them never having seen combat, were quite prepared to butcher unarmed women and children in their beds. So, despite agreeing beforehand to keep destruction to a minimum, if only to preserve the loot, Mason found a firebrand and set the closest tent alight. Others followed suit, and one by one the tents were set ablaze, helped with a liberal scattering of gunpowder. When the fire had spread beyond any hope of putting it out, the order was given to fall back and surround the fort. What happened next was a slaughter. Those scattered Pequots who shot arrows at the colonists from the palisade were gunned down. Those who stayed within the fort were either burnt alive or suffocated on the smoke. And for those who tried to surrender or to flee, two rings of armed men awaited them. The first was made up of English militia, and they shot and stabbed everyone who ran from the flames. Men, women, and children were all killed trying to escape the inferno. If anyone managed to avoid the guns and swords of the colonists, then they were greeted by their native allies, Mohegans, Narragansetts, and Eastern Niantic. Underhill wrote after the fact that many were burnt in the fort, both men, women, and children. Others were forced out, and came in troops to the Indians, twenty and thirty at a time, which our soldiers received and entertained with the point of a sword. Down fell men, women, and children. Those that escaped us fell into the hands of the Indians that were in the rear of us. To the Puritan Mason, this was God's providence. He wrote, Thus were they now at their wits' end, who not many hours before exalted themselves in their great pride, threatening and resolving the utter ruin and destruction of all the English, exulting and rejoicing with songs and dances. But God was above them, who laughed his enemies and the enemies of his people to scorn, making them as a fiery oven. Psalms 21.9 Thus were the stout-hearted spoiled, having slept their last sleep, and none of their men could find their hands. Thus did the Lord judge among the heathen, filling the place with dead bodies. And here we may see the just judgment of God in sending, even the very night before this assault, 150 men from their other fort to join with them of that place, who were designed, as some of themselves reported, to go forth against the English at that very instant when this heavy stroke came upon them, where they perished with their fellows, so that the mischief they intended for us came upon their own pate. They were taken in their own snare, and we, through mercy, escaped. And thus in little more than one hour's space was their impregnable fort with themselves utterly destroyed, to the number of six or seven hundred, as some of themselves confessed. There were only seven taken captive, and about seven escaped. So he's quite pleased with himself, put it that way. The reinforcements, led by Sassicus, were unable to prevent the English from escaping to their ships. Only two English had been killed, 
20 were wounded. At least 500 Pequots, mostly non-combatants, had been killed, and this is a very low estimate. Ignoring the, to put it mildly, moral problems with this, from a strategic perspective, this was a masterstroke. With an outnumbered force, Mason had torn the heart out of Pequot morale, making use of the mobility granted by his allies and the firepower of his troops to burn Fort Mystic to the ground and exterminate everyone inside. For Mason and the Puritans, this was a just act, proof of God's providence and a righteous punishment for the heathen Pequot. But even at the time, such a level of slaughter was not universally praised. We can assume that enough English contemporaries were, at a minimum, uncomfortable with the Mystic Massacre, as it came to be known. The accounts of Mason and Underhill both go to great lengths to emphasise the justness of their cause, the military necessity, and the favour of God in allowing them to pull off the raid. For the native allies, this was certainly a learning experience. Now they knew how the English fought a war, and it terrified them. It was on a scale of brutality they had rarely, if ever, witnessed or conducted themselves. Now, they were no strangers to wars and violence, this isn't a noble savage myth, but, much like the reaction to Miles Standish and his murder of the Wessagusset 15 years previously, this level of violence, this indiscriminate killing, this was shocking. They had now seen what war with the English actually meant, and it would be hard to forget. Mason faced no repercussions for going off script from the civilian leadership, and he would remain the preeminent officer in Connecticut for the rest of his life. He was promoted to major, though whether this came immediately after Mystic or many years later isn't actually clear. He was also elected to various positions, the highest being deputy governor. And that is where we'll leave off today, with Mystic a smouldering ruin and the Pequots on the run. Next week, we will definitely finish this season of Pax Britannica. I know I said that last week, but this time it's actually true. Thank you to the King's favourite, Andrew Shoemaker, the Royal Headsman, executed today, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, the Duke of Ormond, Brendan Bonner, the Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Marquess of Hereford, Christopher Remo, the Marquess of Queensbury, Brent Sitz. As always, you can join their ranks and receive an ad-free RSS feed by going to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. This is Stacy on her motorcycle. What an incredible view! And this is Stacy off her motorcycle. Does this have sucralose in it? On her motorcycle. Oh, the wind in my hair! Off her motorcycle. Uh, it's pronounced etc., not etc. On. Woohoo! Yes! Off. No. You're better on your bike. And with basic policy starting at $75 a year, quote today at progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates annual premium for basic liability policy not available in all states.